Walter Gadevra. This is Will Sanchez. My special guest tonight is Todd Jennings. He's an ultramarathoner. I've heard about Todd through the ultramarathon community, and he recently did a very, very interesting run, the Hudson River 2012, as he calls it. It's all about clean water, folks. about Todd tonight. So please welcome Todd Jennings. Thanks, Will. Glad to be here. Todd, as I begin all my shows the same way, please introduce yourself in terms of where were you born, something about your family, a little bit about your educational background. I actually did not grow up in the New York City area. I grew up in Syracuse, New York, which uh, we call Central New York. Uh, people in this area would call it upstate. Uh, interestingly, I did not have running as a part of my early school years. Uh, but I got into the sport because my baseball skills were not keeping up with some of the other kids on the junior varsity baseball team, and I wanted to make the team the next year. So this was about the time of the Rocky movies, and I was, got all charged up, and I decided that I was going to show up in shape as a way of making the team. It worked for one year. Uh, I didn't make the team the next year, but the running stuck. So um, I've been running since I was about 16 years old, uh, had... Uh, I would say a bit of a hiatus between the ages of 25 and maybe 35 or so. And uh, then I picked it up in earnest again after the age of 35 and began competing f uh, when I turned 40. Wow, that's a big jump. Now, did you go to college or did you have a major? Uh, yeah, I actually have a degree from Clarkson University, formerly Clarkson College. It's in Potsdam, New York, and uh, it's a, a mechanical engineering degree. Um, Oddly, I never really put the mechanical engineering degree to very much use. Um, I think I decided about halfway through college is that engineering really wasn't my bag. Really? Um, but you stuck it out. But I stuck it out and decided I should at least give it a go in the professional world. And uh, it was during that time that I realized that I'm, I'm better suited for other sorts of things. Go into that. But during that time, was you, any athletics? I played softball. I wouldn't call it a fitness activity. I would just call it a social activity where there was, you know, the, the typical social things that happen after the game, if you, if you understand me. Uh-huh, with and the beers and the burgers. That's right. <laughs> um, and, of course, watching a game, but with football or baseball or whatever. Yeah, all, all those kinds of things that young people do when they're just, you know, trying to enjoy themselves. I moved into New York City in uh, my 30s, and I got involved with the, uh, the New York Urban Professionals Basketball League. Mm -hmm. And played a little bit of ball there. I was never in any of the you know more advanced divisions because I'm just not a, a good basketball player. Oh, baseball wasn't your thing. Basketball wasn't your thing in terms of uh, giving you the uh, the enjoyment you were looking. But running did. Running so did. what was the first major run that you did that said you know there's something more to this than I that meets the eye? Well, I had been out of running for a little while, a friend of mine said, hey, you t you, you've talked about running a little bit. Uh, why don't you try a local 5K? I said, hey, why not? Uh, I had two young children at the time mm -hmm. who are much older now, but uh, I trained with them, or I began training with them in a double baby jogger. Um, and I became known as the guy who showed up at the races with the, with the double baby jogger. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I, I was not uh, heavily popular as I was passing people in the latter stages of races with two kids. The babies love being pushed. <laughs> uh, there were times when I was breaking up fights, believe it or not. Yeah, they were a little more than babies at the time. Oh, okay. uh, I, I ran with them until they were actually four and six years old, uh, respect, respectively. Okay, so obviously you joined Joy that so what was the next uh, progression my progression was to try and you know get faster uh, you know doing so without having to push a baby jogger although I, I do want to uh, take a step back and and I did want to say that I once finished eighth overall in a 5k race pushing the kids wow. and, and ironically I did not get a medal I finished fourth in my age group oh okay you gotta finish top three right I was able to get a little faster I was in my early 40s at this point and uh, I think I probably peaked in terms of my ability to get faster at around the age of 45. But at some point, you jumped into the ultra marathon world. Was there intermediary steps? There was certainly a, a hinge pin that uh, took me from the 
just the marathoning side of things uh, into the ultra marathoning world. And it was it was the day, and I, I'll remember the day for the rest of my life. It was November fourth, two thousand and eight. Uh, I met Marshall Ulrich, who most of the people in our community, you know, know. Uh, he's a very well-known ultra runner, mm -hmm. uh, champion of a number of events, including the Badwater Ultra Marathon. Marshall did a documentary film with Charlie Engel, who he began the run with. They were calling for cast members, and I was chosen. And on the last day, when he came across the George Washington Bridge into New York City, I had, you know, the, the honor of running with him. And uh, interesting, but that was uh, extremely exciting. I guess they were filming most of it. Yes, the film crew was there, and the director was very specific with us on what we could and couldn't do in terms of you know the running. Uh, on that particular evening, it was election day, and President Obama was in the process of being elected into office, and the director had Marshall run right down Broadway through Times Square, and uh, I'll never forget the night. But but watching him run, watching him probably do ten minute per mile pace after having run three thousand wow. miles was my inspiration. I said, hey, I want to try that. I want to try what he did. And uh, I've been moving in that direction ever since. Have you done a number of marathons before you jump into the ultra marathon? I've done 10 f you know, formal marathons. Um, I've done a lot of other r runs of greater than the marathon distance. Uh, and I've also done uh, informal marathons with the, uh, the holiday marathon folks right, right. That, that used to do the events up in Van Cortlandt Park. Cortland Park. I have to say I love Boston, only because I think anybody who's done Boston is just very impressed by the event itself. There's a lot of um, ceremony to it. Um, you know, it's, it's the big kahuna. Um, but aside from Boston, I would have to say the Vermont City Marathon, which I've done three times. It's one of the best small city marathons you could ever want. Right. It's very well organized. Uh, it's a scenic course. The last five miles, you're running along Lake Champlain, and you're seeing the Adirondacks across, uh, yes, across yes, the lake yes. in the that distance. Yes, yes, That was my first marathon, oh, believe so it or you not. Know. I know it very well. Pre and preaching to the it, choir. And it loops around itself, so you can, it, people can watch it like three or four times. That's right. That's exactly right. You can it's stand in one, one place, and, you can, and the, the one big hill, uh, the battery, they call it. So... Um, one of the clubs that I belong to uh, calls that the assault on battery. <laughs> <laughs> but now, it, now that's so popular, it closes out within, I think it now it's by lottery, I'm not sure, but it closes out, it sells out. It does sell out very quickly. What inspired you to go even further? Well, uh, Marshall was certainly a part of it, but an, another part of me turning in the ultra direction was having a conversation with a friend. We, we kind of made a pact that we would, we would focus more on going longer rather than trying to get faster because we knew we couldn't get faster. Okay. So um, I began looking at opportunities to just run longer, first in an informal way, um, and then in a more formal way, and I don't mean by that, I don't mean racing, but uh, organized uh, distance runs. And the first ones that I remember doing were the, basically the Ted Corbett run, which is the run around Manhattan. Uh, 32 miles around the perimeter of the island. Interesting. It's called the Ted Corporate Run. Well, uh, uh, that's that's what some of the people in the community refer to it as. Uh, I don't know if there's uh, a specific course mm -hmm. that is uh, designated as the Ted Corbett course, but um, I came to learn that Ted Corbett uh, ran around Manhattan as training runs. Sometimes he would do two times in a row. <laughs> so I thought, gee, if somebody can do it twice, I ought to be able to at least do it once. There's so a new route now where you don't have to go up the stairs at 155th Street right, uh, right. where you're getting onto the Harlem River Drive. There's another way around it. I've because I think you did one recently or you did a part of one with, uh, with Scott Jarek. I did, yeah. Scott Jarek was in town uh, about six weeks ago or five weeks ago promoting I'm wearing his, his, shirt. his new book, and you are, right? I did part of the run with Scott. I was recovering from a long run at that point, uh, so I only ran about 12 of the 32 miles. But I think formally I've probably done the run around Manhattan six or seven times at this really? point. Really? And, and now they have a course without any stairs involved? Right. There is a way to do, do it. it. Okay. I'll be glad to take you if you want. 26.2 <laughs> uh, has been plenty for me. Now known for your, the Hudson River run that you did. How did that start? And what was the thinking behind that? I've been excited about doing something for charity for a long, long time. I wanted to do another notable ultra, but make it big and, and have it stand out. I had worked on a trail project running in, in Harriman State Park where I, I ran in 2010. I ran all the marked and maintained trails of the park in one season. For the 240 unique miles 
uh, I had to run about 330 miles. Somehow or other, I, I came to find out that the Hudson River was 315 miles long. And I said, that's about the same as Harriman State Park that I ran in Harriman State Park. So I began to focus on you know, what it would take to, to accomplish that as a solo run. So one of the first things I did was align myself with a charity that's Clearwater, Hudson River Sloop Clearwater, which was Pete Seeger's organization and brainchild back in the late 60s. Yep. So I approached the Clearwater people. As it turned out, their development director was a lifelong runner, and she said, this is fantastic. We've never done a project with a runner before. Everyone wants to do it. So you know, we began working on the logistics and the promotion, and uh, in May of this year, uh, I did the run. to do it, but you were the only one. I was the only one who had to run. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was deliberate on your part. You weren't looking for teammates. That's right. That's right. I, I wanted to do it as a solo run, and a couple of my uh, advisors, mentors, people who I, I admire in the running community said, this, this is the way you should do it. I decided I, I wanted to do the run in May. Uh, it seemed a good time. I waited for the snow to sort of uh, come off the mountains of the Adirondacks before I started it. Having done ultras, I thought, well, I ought to be able to do 40 miles a day. I didn't think 50 or 60 was within my capabilities, mm -hmm. but I thought I could do 40 a day for eight days, and that ought to just about cover okay. it. Being a charity run, did you prepare collateral materials in order to fundraise? Yeah, we started with a press release, which was done in January, announcing the run. Uh, I chose CrowdRise.com as a, uh, a, a web tool, as a charitable partner for helping raise the money. I have a close friend, and he volunteered many, many, many hours of his time helping push out the word to the press uh, so that we could get press coverage mm. and, and great awareness. What's the biggest th misconception about the Hudson River that the public has that you learn? Well, the misconception is that it's clean now. Um, and that's because everybody knows that in the 1960s and even the 70s, the Hudson was at its worst. Now it's clean. Hey, they hold the New York City Triathlon here, and people swim in the river. It must be fine. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it's not. And, and unless there are ongoing uh, uh, protection programs and educational programs aimed at, at keeping the river not only as clean as it is, but then taking it to another step and making it even cleaner, you know, we have to we have to keep awareness on a high level. Mm -hmm. So what what Hudson River Sloop Clearwater does, and there are many organizations that are involved in the protection of the river. Their main mission is education. Mm -hmm. They don't actually go out there and, and perform the cleanup. But but Pete Seeger's idea was if we teach people, and particularly young people, uh, about the river and the importance of keeping it clean, they're going to turn into adults who make that their priority. Mm -hmm. So and you know, clean river doesn't mean you know, you don't throw stuff into it. It also means the watersheds as well, all the groundwater that surrounds it, because eventually everything runs into the river. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, everything we do, you know, anybody who's anywhere near the river, it's important that we, we be mindful about the, the, the health of the river. Yeah, well, I guess we do take Cousin River for granted. We do. And Pete Seeker's been around forever. Is he still singing and kicking? Pete's still kicking. He's 93 years old, and I had the uh, pleasure of meeting him at the Clearwater uh, Revival Festival a couple of weeks ago. They hold that up in Croton on Hudson uh, every year. He's, he, he, he looks great. He looks great and uh, still the great smile. Um, 
I didn't get a chance to see him perform, mm -hmm. but it was wonderful to meet him. And you know, he's. I think he'll be an inspiration long after he's gone. There are other organizations involved. Uh, one of the early ones that I know of is the uh, the Shaw Walkers. Uh, I think was founded by Cy Adler. That's right. A few weeks ago, you alerted me to him, and I did a little a little learning and digging, and I, I thought that wow, what a wonderful thing that he had in mind. Cy is uh, an amazing walker. He's uh, one of the early ultra walkers before it became so very popular. Uh, I, I, I've done the show walker with him once, and I could not keep up with the man. He's been an advocate for clean water, for shore walking, and for uh, protecting the shore. And he's very good friends with Pete Seeger because uh, I believe Pete even wrote their theme song for the shore walkers. How about that? So you said you planned it out for eight days. So how did that turn out? Did eight days be the right amount? The most difficult part of the pre-planning wasn't the training for the event. It was actually the logistics. And um, I didn't really have a heart to ask somebody to take an entire week or more off of work and, and be a sole support person. So I decided that I would ask multiple crews to be involved. So I highly organized it. I had crew members assigned for each of the eight days. Some people did crew for me on more than one day. But everything was sort of set on the schedule. And the difficulty with me was not so much in relying on the people to show up, because I knew they would, but in knowing that I was going to be able to stay on the run schedule, because I really didn't have complete confidence that I was going to be able to run 40 miles every day on the average. As it turned out, I was able to keep to the schedule for the first four days. But then reality set in. On the fifth day, I came down with a tendonitis injury that seemed like it was going to completely sabotage the run. Wow. But with a little bit of help from my friend Marshall Ulrich, who uh, I, I rang in desperation on that night, he gave me a plan to, to be able to finish the run instead of in three more days uh, over the course of four. So the entire run end, ended up being nine days instead of eight. He said the, you know, the most important thing is don't give up. Don't lose sight of the finish line. His motto is never pull yourself off the course. What yeah. I had to do in order to get through each day was icing of the thighs, which became... Uh, very, very sore, uh, especially after the second or third day. And then in the morning, I would take a hot um, Epsom salt bath with water about as hot as I could stand, just to get the blood flowing again. And for the most part, I was able to get out the door every day, um, just based with you know based on that regimen. Okay, it must have been a different place every day, right? You were right, running home. <laughs> right, it was. I didn't. I didn't commute for this until the last three days. Part of my pre-run process was gathering sponsorship in the form of uh, the in-kind variety through hotels and inns and so forth uh -huh, along uh -huh. the way. So I would pick towns that I had planned to stop, find a hotel there, call them up on the phone and beg for a free room. Uh, for the most part, everybody you know was very glad to help. Who were the hotels? The Alpine Lodge was the one that I stayed at for the first three nights Alpine. when I was up up in the Adirondacks. Alpine, that was good up in North Creek, New York. Uh, then the uh, the country. Inn and Suites, which was in Glens Falls, was also very helpful. And then the Comfort Inn, which was in Albany. Um, actually, when I got south of Albany, I was hosted by a friend, or I was able to, to actually commute and go home to my own bed uh -huh. each of the nights after that. Excellent. Now, you said you had a little group that was advising you, other ultramarathons. What was some of the advice they were giving you? The advice was pace yourself, walk a lot. Then later on, I had another person tell me that I probably was not walking enough. Uh, when I said I was walking 20 to 25 percent of the time, I was said uh, I was told maybe a third to even as much as 40 percent in an endeavor like this. So even among the ultra marathoners, they have a different perspective. They do, right? And it wasn't all people who had done stage runs before. Uh, Frank Giannino, uh, he's the one who owns the transcontinental record for the fastest crossing. He was my first and foremost advisor and my biggest cheerleader yeah. on the project. Yeah. Uh, he's the one who ultimately directed me to Sloop Clearwater um, because he had done a similar run down the Hudson in 1980 and had also raised money for Sloop Clearwater. So right. What was his advice? He was the one who told me, do it alone. Don't do it with anybody else formally. Uh, he also said, you know, plan to walk a lot. And uh, he said, use technology. Use the internet, use the social media, uh, use GPS technology to help you. Uh, I used Map My Run in order to, you know, map a route and put it out there on the internet for everybody to see. Mm -hmm. um, 
yeah, I had all that. So Frank was very helpful. Well, that's great. So there was no danger of you getting lost. They knew exactly where you were. Definitely no danger of getting lost. And and the idea was I wanted to stay uh, as close to the river as I could without going on any unreasonable roads or taking any un unreasonable routes that would take me up and down hills. What were the most interesting things you saw during the route? Most Did you meet anybody interesting? <laughs> well... I didn't meet a lot of uh, people, new people along the way, but um, because there was a lot of interest in what I was doing, I had a lot of people who wanted to run with me. So over the course of the nine days, I had a grand total of 59 unique guest runners, 21 or two of which were on the final day when I came from Nyack over the GW Bridge into Manhattan and then ultimately down to the Battery. The ending was the Battery Park City? Right, the ending was at the Battery, and that was, that was planned all along. Um, that, by most people's accounts, is the end of the Hudson River, although some people will say it's really the Verrazano Bridge, but um, tomato, tomato. Okay. Uh, we had a little bit of a ceremony when we got to the Battery because uh, when I was at the source of the Hudson, uh, which is reputed to be uh, Lake Tear of the Clouds, it's on uh, the face of Mount Marcy, what I had done there was um, gathered water in a small vial from Lake Tear. I brought it with me along the entire trip, and then poured the water into New York Harbor when we got to the battery. Excellent. So a nine-day nine trip for the water. Let it go free. I let it go free. Um, now, interesting. Were your children there at the end? Or? No, my children weren't able to be with me at the end, but uh, I did have a real sweet honor having my 14-year-old run with me uh, at the end of day seven, which was in Cornwall, New York. Oh, excellent. Was he one of the ones in, in the stroller? Oh, he, is, he was one of the ones who had been in the stroller well, as a, he had, as know, a small child. Of that, you know. <laughs> now, as a 14-year-old, he's on his eighth-grade cross-country team. Yeah. Are you still collecting uh, for the fun? Uh, uh, actually, people, people? We, we have closed out the fundraising at this point. Uh, my target was $50,000. I don't know if that was a lofty goal or not. But we did raise $17,000, and even though it was nowhere near my goal, everybody who was involved... Uh, the CrowdRise people, the folks at Clearwater were all very pleased, so I couldn't be more pleased oh, myself. It sounds like a tremendous effort all around. And people, of course, can still donate to uh, to the cause, even if it's not officially. To Clearwater, to right. To Clearwater. And I see you keep looking at my shirt. Yes. This was, this was uh, our official uh, event shirt. It was designed by my girlfriend's brother. His name is Greg uh, Petrosky. Um, and uh, it was it was thought of over Easter dinner. Uh, and, That's right. You needed a shirt. And, and we time. needed a shirt. So uh, I probably shouldn't uh, speak the word on camera, but uh, most of the viewers can, you know, see what it says. And, uh, you know, we incorporated uh, sort of a clean water, a clean droplet of water into the logo. I think, I think it's a very distinctive shirt, and uh, I don't think anybody would have any problem with it. And for sale on CafePress.com, by the way. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, did you wear that shirt or some of the time? Or? I didn't wear the shirt on the run. Um, actually, I wore a couple of sponsor shirts along the run and then some of my, you know, my own clothing. Yeah, but I, I did wear this shirt uh, at um, a bit of a celebration party at the very end. Cool. Now, during that lonesome run, <laughs> how did you entertain yourself? Uh, well, I had the benefit of having uh, a crew who were stopping every mile. So I didn't really have to spend too much time entertaining myself. And the other thing, as you were alluding to before, was there was a lot of scenery. Um, all along the way, different things, things I'd never seen before. Some of the route I had actually... Uh, I was very familiar with, especially downriver, but uh, I would say above Kingston, there was much of the route that I had actually never seen. So um, what kept me entertained was looking at the river at, and, and uh, its many sights. Yeah. So you weren't just playing music, you were just enjoying the scene. No, I'm not a music uh, runner. Uh, you never see me with buds in my ears. Okay. Uh, so I let the river do the, do the singing Sounds for me. Sounds like a wonderful way to spend eight days. What was, uh, what, how did you do your bathroom breaks? Um, bathroom breaks were wherever nature allowed me. <laughs> <laughs> and you, there, were, there were no issues there where, you know, oops. Uh, no, uh, no specific issues. Maybe it was, you know, all those days in, in the open sun that were just drying me out. But there was one place uh, on day three where I was desperate for a bathroom. And uh, almost by serendipity, I came upon... Uh, uh, I would call it, I guess it's, it's sort of a, like a kayaking barracks uh -huh. uh, along the upper river. And uh, although it was early in the morning and the 
kayak place wasn't open. The bathroom was open to the outdoors, so oh, I was able to excellent. just walk right in and take that care is, of my business. That was lucky. I guess uh, you didn't plan the bathroom breaks. I mean, <laughs> where, where can I go to the bathroom? So long no, I didn't really think about it. And, That's uh, interesting. I know in, uh, in the long runs that I do, and we do it in New York, we got to know where the Starbucks are. That's right. <laughs> but I guess there were no Starbucks on the your trail, you know. No, I can't say that I saw one Starbucks anywhere along the way. <laughs> the obvious question is, from everyone, what's next? And uh, just like I said after I had done the trail running project in Harriman State Park, I said, I really don't know. Um, but something came to me recently. Um, I had been thinking about keeping it under wraps, but since we're on television, I'll... I'll let it out. But this is an exclusive? Uh, this this is, a... is sort of an exclusive. Oh, okay. Yeah. Newsflash. Newsflash. Yes. What uh, is it? I have a friend who lives in Miami who does relief work uh, in Haiti. And my notion is sometime in, in 2013, probably in the fall, uh, I would like to do a benefit run in Haiti for Haiti. Somewhere between 300 and 500 miles. Wow, but Haiti's very, I think, very hot. <laughs> it's hot, and it is not the most hospitable place to run from the non-weather point of perspective. So a lot of thinking is going to need to go into this, but it is something that I want to do, so I'm going to keep focusing on that. Uh, this weekend, I think you said you're going to be crewing for Badwater. That's right. I, I'm going out to Badwater to see the, the desert and Death Valley for the first time in my life. I'm sure it'll be beautiful, but very hot. I'm crewing for a friend. And uh, I think I'll come back with a lot of positives from the experience. Great. I mean, you get to experience some real heat. That's real heat, right. <laughs> if Haiti is hot, it won't be anything like bad water. I have no idea. <laughs> but listen, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me. It was my pleasure to be here, Will. And, uh, and a tremendous effort on you on the Hudson River Run of 2012. Well, that implies, is there going to be future ones? Um, <laughs> I, I can't make any promises, but uh, if I ever do a run like that again, I was thinking maybe that I would involve other people and perhaps even make it a relay. I think that's a great idea, a relay. It's not a, it's not a new tradition. Right. Maybe Cy Atlas can walk part of it. He's not a runner yet because I think he's uh, probably in the 70s. We'll see if we can get it. <laughs> Thank you again, Tom. Thanks, Will.